we are one, but we are many. Okay, so can everybody see that okay? Yeah, lovely. Excellent. Okay, now I'll just move a couple of windows out of the way. So, all right, so um, what I was going to do today was just to take you through uh, one of my current uh, projects that I've got on, which is to compile the Illustrated Minerals of Australia. And um, as you can probably imagine, that's a, that's a fairly large project. Um, it's going to take quite a long time to, to complete. And rather than waiting until the end, it's been published in parts in the monthly Mineral Chronicles, which comes out obviously monthly. Um, and I'm doing it alphabetically. So uh, the next issue will be the end of the uh, minerals beginning with A, and we'll start moving into uh, B, which would be good. So, uh, if anybody's interested in the, um, uh, not working on the, that's it. If anybody's uh, interested, they can go to sorelpublications.com and that will uh, give you um, details on how to subscribe to, to this particular. Um, magazine. So here's an example. I did a test print uh, after I'd done the first few, but just to see what it came up like. It's going to be eventually going to be printed through Lulu, which is a print on demand service, and it will be done in um, volumes because there's too much to do in one. And um, I'll just get to the point where I've got enough to, to make it worthwhile to do the, the first volume, and that'll be a combination of a number of parts. All right, just a, a little bit about Minerals of Australia. First of all, there's around about 1,500, a bit over 1,500 species that have been recorded. And there's 182 of those are type locality species. There will, about 800 will be uh, illustrated in total in this publication. Uh, and some of these not muted. Um, in the minerals beginning with the letter A, which is what we're going to have a look at today, there's more than 100 of those. Almost half of those will be illustrated in this presentation alone, and there's even more in the actual publication. So what I've tried to do here today is primarily stick to ones where it's micro photos, and some species, uh, it doesn't make uh, any sense at all to, to have it as a micro photo. Um, so they've been more or less left out of this publication. And uh, it, there's probably around about 100 or so slides and 133 specimen photographs that you'll see today. Most of these have been uh, are recent ones that have either been redone or are, are brand new, uh, just depending on, um, on what my earlier photography skills were like. And I'll show an example of something like that towards the end. Um, also, we will be finishing off with Asiarite being alphabetic and being a blue mineral. I was hoping that um, a certain blue mineral person was going to be on the call today, but he's not. So you'll miss out. You'll have to wait. Okay, <clears throat> Australia itself, I think everybody knows where it is on the, the planet. Uh, it's made up of five states and two main uh, territories, and those being the Australian capital territory here, 
and the Northern Territory up here. Um, and the whole, the total land mass is about 7.6 million square kilometers. So it's a fairly large, large place. Now I've said also there's a few add-ons there, things like Christmas Island. Uh, there's a couple of uh, Antarctic uh, islands, which are part of Australia as well, that are separate territories, but we're not going to worry about those. And just looking at the average age of rocks in Australia, it's, it's mostly a fairly old continent. So um, you can see the, the, the red areas here, or pink, are the oldest areas of Australia, Western Australia and South Australia, uh, and they are more than two and a half billion years old. Then we have the, uh, the orange area, which is a fair chunk of the west of the, the country and a little bit in the, the northwest of Tasmania, uh, which are around about the, the one to two and a half billion years. And then the blue areas uh, are the younger rocks. And uh, a lot of those are um, Cambrian or um, Ordovician, Silurian, and then we've got tertiary basalts and, and so on. Um, a little bit of, of Jurassic and Permian and Triassic as well, but, but mostly the others. And this eastern half of, of the country uh, has mostly been created due to plate tectonics, which are now obviously affecting New Zealand more so than Australia. Uh, but there's a, a, a line of um, smallish mountains that run down through the eastern part of Australia and across Victoria. Uh, that are, are caused by the collision of the uh, the plates. Right, so if we get into the, the minerals themselves, the cantite is the first one, and the cantite is these little feathery needles that you can see uh, around the top here, and it's sitting on wires of native silver, uh, and that's from um, Broken Hill. Uh, a cantite is the uh, stable form at, uh, at sort of room temperature or whatever. Um, and argentite, uh, a lot of the references to argentite are actually a cantite after argentite. It's very widespread, widespread in um, silver lead uh, deposits. We've got a few of those such as, you know, Broken Hill and West Coast of Tasmania and others. <coughs> uh, and mainly as, as part of the silver ore, it's very rare that, that we actually get good crystals of a cantite. So um, Broken Hill is one of the main areas, the magnet mine in, in um, Tasmania. Uh, I've actually found some there as well. It's very, very tiny. And in Mount Lyle in Queenstown, Tasmania, where uh, the silver that was found at one time, and it's called the, the Bonanza, uh, analyzed at 8,765 ounces of silver per tonne. And the majority of that was uh, Argentite, although there's some native silver as well. And here on the, the left hand side, we've got another little silver wire that runs through there with a cantite uh, all across it. And on the right hand side, uh, we've got a chlorhydrite crystal here, a silver uh, halide, um, with minium uh, lead oxychloride, uh, oxy, no, just lead oxy, oxy. Um, and the acantite again is these little silvery sort of spiky bits that you can see here and there. Actinolite's uh, the next one. It's a fairly common uh, amphibole min mineral, uh, but it can be very difficult to determine. Um, we, we've had a few uh, locations where traditionally uh, these green prismatic crystals have been called actinolite but they've actually been found to be ferroactinolite or, or some other uh, amphibole. Um, it can form as, as distinct green crystals uh, or as asbestiform uh, bisolite fibers uh, or massive. And it's found in all states and uh, the mainland territories and also as the, the form of uh, nephrite jade in uh, South Australia and in Trial Harbour in Tasmania. And you'll see each of the photos has got uh, a title underneath with the size as well. So you get a feel for, for how small most of these specimens actually are. And uh, for Sheila and others, I've included the, uh, the formulas uh, underneath the, the mineral names too. 
here's a couple of um, actinolites from Tasmania. Uh, this one's a close up. This one's a, a larger specimen. You can see that it's a width of view of uh, 40 mil. And James Melville provided the, um, the photograph of one of his specimens. And in both of these instances, you can see purple uh, axonite crystals. Adamite's not a common mineral in Australia. Um, it occurs at a, a small number of localities. <clears throat> so Broken Hill and uh, a couple of localities in South Australia and over in Western Australia. But it does come in a number of different colours. The habits are pretty consistent. So these blocky sort of crystals. Um, this particular one here is probably being coloured by uh, the manganese mineral and it's probably more reflected color rather than actual color of the, the uh, crystals themselves. <clears throat> we get pale greenish yellow crystals in Padova. In Broken Hill, uh, we get a couple of different colors. Uh, this is the rarer one being a, a, yellow, a yellow crystal. Um, and this was an interesting one too in that had these little orange tetrahedral crystals up here, which are actually pharmacosiderite. And I hadn't actually, it wasn't labelled, and I hadn't actually noticed it until I did the photograph. Hey, Steve. Mm -hmm. Do the Australian atomites, do they fluoresce green? Um, not anywhere near what the uh, Mexican ones do, no, don't. Okay. Um, the one up on the top le left-hand corner here, again, is probably reflected colour, being that sort of brownish colour, which is sort of a dark grey otherwise. Uh, and uh, the... Hollandite is these little hemispheres, the black hemispheres on the, the matrix. <clears throat> and then we've got the purple manganone atomite, uh, again from Padova. And this is the best one that I could actually find. It is actually a crystal. Uh, the rest of it's sort of not really crystalline, but that's the best one that I could actually find to photograph. Now, Adrene is another uh, pyroxene, a clonoperoxene. And once again, this is one that, that uh, was probably thought to be much more common than it actually may be. Um, a lot of the Adrene these days has been reclassified into Adrene orgite because it's in, in the range between the two. And that seems to be a, um, a sort of a standard name for it. But this particular one is um, analysed as uh, Adrene. Um, and it's interesting that in Mindat, there's only one Australian Adrene photo, but the description of that one says it's Adrene org orgite. So um, that just shows how rare <laughs> Adrene is in Australia. And as you can see, that's a very, very small uh, specimen. That particular location is an interesting one, Dog's Head Tier. Uh, it's a, a location that I found a number of years ago when I was living in Tassie and it's halfway up what we call the Western Tiers which is uh, one of the central it's a central mountain range in Tasmania and it's a, it's a dirt road a gravel road and I was doing what I normally do out and about looking for for somewhere to break a few rocks and noticed uh, that there was a fair bit of material on the side of the road on this one particular bend so I stopped the car and got out and had a look and found that there was quite a lot of um, minerals in the very small cavities, such as samadines and um, aragonites and uh, others. And these ones were, were particularly nice. <clears throat> now, the Adrian orgite is the one that, that seems to be a lot of the ones that have, have been identified as now. Uh, it can be visually very similar to Adrian itself. Um, sometimes the color is a little bit different. In this particular instance here, it's more of a yellow rather than a, a green, uh, but it can be green as well. And it always seems to, uh, at the two localities listed here, uh, Anik, Mount Anarchy and Mount Shadwell, both in Victoria, it occurs on the edges of a quartz fenacrist. So <clears throat> this bit of quartz has been dragged up when the volcano's um, gone off and the Adrian orgite has formed around the edge of the, the quartz enolith. And you can also see here sort of bubbly look, which is actually highlight opal too. 
Um, agarite's pretty rare in Australia, and um, there are the three of the four, at least, um, of the rare earth elements have been recorded. Uh, Agardite CE is, is the most common one, but unless you actually analyze uh, specimens, it's very difficult to actually determine which particular rare earth uh, end member it actually is. Most of them have components of each of the others as well. So you might get a, an Agardite CE, which might be 60% CE, 30% LA and 10% ND or whatever. Um, so generally you've got to go with what's been recorded uh, for a particular locality. And because it's so difficult to dis distinguish them in this publication, they're all under a guardite as a, a single sort of a heading. Um, in terms of Australian occurrences, uh, Broken Hill, we have a guardite Y. Uh, we have a guardite Y at Dome Rock in South Australia. And then in Cobar and in the Telfer Mine in Western Australia, we have three that have all been recorded. And uh, having read some of the references of some of these uh, localities, uh, I think sometimes in Mindat, it actually says that there is a Gardite CE and a Gardite ND or whatever, but the actual specimens might have only been analysed as a Gardite CE being the primary one. Uh, they just happen to have been listed three times for each one. So it can be a little bit confusing. Um, they can also be uh, confused with mixite as well. And somewhere like um, Dome Rock in South Australia, mixite and agardite both occur, which makes it a little bit tough. So we've got a, a Kintor open cut Broken Hill one on the, the left hand side here and a Dome Rock one on the right. A Dome Rock uh, is quite often is with um, Chrysocolla and the Chrysocolla can be either the blue as you can see here, the light blue, or it can be a green, or it can even be black, which is interesting. I'm assuming that there's maybe Tannerite or something like that as part of the, uh, uh, the mixture. Um, and again, here you can see that there is highlight opal uh, dotted around on this one. It's actually, if you can see down the bottom there, it's actually sitting over the top of one of the, the needles of agardite. And from the new Cobar mine, uh, this is an analyzed specimen of agardite Y, even though the three of them occur there. And it's on a mimetite crystal, yellow mimetite, with the C-axis looking down that way. So it's quite a nice one. Another rare phosphate, this has only been recorded at one locality in Australia, and it's a halite, uh, an iron aluminium phosphate. And it occurs as these sort of discs, uh, flattened discs, that are in a, a very thin cavity, and only from the Bali Low Mine in Western Australia. This is an older photo. Uh, only because I've struggled to actually find the uh, specimen so I can retake it. I think I've found it for now, but I haven't had a chance to, to do it yet. So aconite is a, a sulfur salt, uh, which is fairly rare. Um, and most occurrences in Australia have been described uh, purely from analyses of silver ore sam samples. So it's part of the ore, but a very small component of the ore. But at the Cara mine in Tasmania, it was found as these distinct crystals. Um, that crystal group there is two and a half millimetres in, in size, and that's sort of fairly average for the occurrence. Uh, and that was something that, that I found um, probably 20 years ago in, uh, in Cara, maybe longer actually, 25 years probably. And you actually um, uh, etch the calcite away to to find them and they're sitting on andradite garnet. Alabandite, this is one of the few ones I did keep in here. Uh, that's a 21 millimeter specimen. So there's no micro photos of alabandite because you don't get very pretty crystals at all. These are the crystals that you actually get. So I left it there for reference. But it is a rare manganese sulfide. Uh, it occurs 
uh, at Broken Hill. It is very rare, but it was found in large masses when it was found. Um, and what I didn't know until I started uh, doing a bit of research is that on the freshly broken surfaces, it's a dark olive green in color, but it, it uh, changes to this sort of yucky brown. And it's also found in a number of uh, meteorites uh, that uh, have landed in Australia too. <clears throat> right, we have a, a very common mineral being albite that comes in a number of different forms. In the publication itself, there are uh, larger uh, albite crystal photos. Um, here I've restricted it just to the one photo of uh, a fairly small one. This is the um, uh, andesine variety that occurs in volcanic rocks. And um, it, it's quite common, particularly here in Victoria. We've got ilmenite crystal sitting here as well. Um, they can be quite uh, attractive. There's actually a number of different crystals here. That one's a little sort of rectangular one sitting on top of the others as well. Uh, it occurs as andesine, like this one, as a northoclase and a sunstone, as well as the, the standard uh, albite crystals. Forms in a hell of a lot of different um, uh, environments, including pegmatites, including vol volcanic rocks, uh, and uh, even carbonatite and at the Hartz range and uh, others as well. Another rare one here is aldermanite. Um, if you have a look at the photos on Mindat, the most of the photos on Mindat, you won't see the actual crystals on the specimens. This here is a fluorite crystal that has been coated by aldermanite. And the aldermanite are these tiny little um, sort of micaceous crystals that are, are covering the whole thing. Uh, it's the, uh, the best photo I think I've, I've been able to get that actually shows the, the crystals in that sort of level of detail. Um, it's pretty hard to get any, any closer than that. It's found at uh, five localities all in South Australia, including the type locality at the McAlter Phosphate Quarry. Uh, all of these are phosphate quarries except for Penrice, but Penrice had a phosphate lens sitting over the top of the, the marble, uh, the limestone that they were actually um, quarrying at that particular location. Another type locality one is aldrigite, and it's one of a number of cadmium uh, secondary minerals that have been found in recent times uh, at Broken Hill. Uh, Peter Elliott in South Australia uh, seems to be able to pick these quite quite um, readily. And um, it's the little pale blue needles that you can see here. Uh, there's a bit of smithsonite in here as well, which is these elongated crystals. <clears throat> it has been recorded to other places in the world since uh, the broken hill occurrence, and that's in uh, Greece and New Mexico. Now, alanite is fairly common, but um, oh, somebody coming in. Uh, it's fairly common phosphate, and uh, for the most part, is normally in good crystals. Is found in uh, pegmatites or, or um, cavities uh, in the rocks. At this particular locality here, Mount Cole, which is about forty minutes drive from where I live. It occurs as part of the actual uh, matrix of the granite itself. And uh, there's also uh, titanite. And you can see here, there's a little brown crystal. That's titanite, and this is the alanite. Um, most of them, and I've collected quite a bit of granite from there to break open to, to try and find these, these minerals. Most of them, both minerals actually fracture. Um, they can be quite similar looking, but when they actually fracture, sometimes it's a good thing because the alanite always fra fractures along that way. That's your C axis. They always fracture that way. And the titanite fracture uh, the other way across the crystal. So um, that's one way of being able to tell, tell them apart, even if the, the colors are very close together. In terms of um, uh, major Australian occurrences, though, 
the Mary Kathleen mine in Queensland had um, some quite well formed crystals of two or three centimetres across, so a reasonable size. Alophane is a, an amorphous clay mineral um, and it's usually fairly ordinary looking, um, but we do get some unusual ones such as this one here, which is uh, a, a blue form from Western Australia with little hematite uh, crystals dotted through it. But quite often uh, you get things like the brown stalactites in Parwin lava caves, it's ugly. If you think that the uh, alabandite is ugly, the alophane is worse. <laughs> uh, we do have a, a number of different garnets. Um, the almondine garnet generally is not pure almondine. Uh, it's uh, usually a mixture of, of um, three or so different ones, but if it's called almondine, it's, it's primarily more than 50% um, of almondine in, in the uh, analysis and it usually occurs as a red or brown garnet quite often in uh, granites or uh, metamorphic rocks and this particular one here is actually embedded in a mica sheet uh, and that's fairly typical for the, some of the locations in the Harps Range in Northern Territory. <clears throat> Probably the best known ones in Australia though are the ones from Ireland's Garnet Mine at Thakaringa in New South Wales, which is a little bit uh, southwest of Broken Hill. And uh, if you go to Tucson and you see Tom Capitani's, one of his um, uh, rooms, you'll see garnet crystals in matrix and the matrix might be two to three meters across and the garnet crystals are, you know, grapefruit sized. They're very large, but they're, they're opaque as well. Alstonite is very rare in Australia. It's really only been found from two localities. I haven't seen any from the uh, coal, coal measures in New South Wales, but the, uh, the Rosebury occurrence, um, very typical double terminated crystals associated with harmatome and sulphides. And they're very, very attractive, but we're only found in one area. The harmatome has been found since the Alstonite um, uh, discovery, but there were no more alcinite crystals. And here's a couple of other photos of, of specimens from Rosebury. Alienite is um, widespread, but rare as crystals. So mostly uh, the occurrence is uh, just basically masses. Um, and really the uh, Iron Monarch uh, occurrence is probably one of the best ones uh, in Australia and that's these these nice little euhedral uh, yellow crystals that you can see here but most of them are just chalky masses. Analcime is very very common. It's one of the, uh, the common zeolites <clears throat> that occurs as um, very distinctive Trapeze, trapezohedron uh, crystals such as this one. This is an interesting one in that um, there, in this particular vug there are about three or four larger crystals, I'll say larger, uh, that's three and a half millimetres from there to there so they're still not massive but all of the larger crystals have got this underlying something that, that is um, showing through with the transparency of the crystal but all of the smaller crystals such as this one don't have that uh, in the vogue at all, which is quite an interesting one. It's found at very, very many uh, um, basalt, predominantly basalt uh, areas around Australia. And um, one of the uh, nicer ones that you find are the large crystals from Cape Grim. You'll sometimes see those available for sale on the internet. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there's just a couple of other examples. Flinders with melanite, which is the red uh, crystal uh, on the outside of it there. And one from the Doughboys, which is near Cape Grim. Anatase titanium oxide uh, is a very common mineral 
uh, found in a number of different environments. Uh, the most of the um, the better quality specimens, I suppose, are very sharp crystals on usually on quartz or in quartz uh, in a, a variety of different uh, environments in granites uh, in particular, but also uh, quartz veins, hydrothermal veins, and so on. Uh, this particular one here is from Karapui, which is uh, about 40 minutes, 45 minutes away from where I live. And it was actually uh, taken out of heavy mineral sands and separated by hand. And I can't imagine sitting there with basically a little conveyor belt pushing these little crystals, which are very small, and to one of five little piles of the different minerals that they're actually looking at doing. But uh, the late Judy Rowe actually did that. Uh, and pretty well all of the specimens that are in people's collections, such as this one, actually came from the work that, that Judy did. <clears throat> a couple of examples from uh, Spalding Bundelier uh, in South Australia. The one on the left here, this one is actually an inclusion. So that's totally included in the quartz crystal. <coughs> Excuse me. It's quite um, a, a challenge to, to get a good photograph of. And then the, the one on the right, these ones are sort of slightly embedded in, in the quartz. And almost every single one of them is a zoned orange through blue or blue green, where the orange is in the center of the uh, crystals and the blue green uh, towards the uh, um, terminations. Another one of the garnets and the only other one in the A minerals is andradite. Uh, it's another common garnet. It can be difficult to determine whether it's andradite or grossula. Again, the, the um, uh, analyses generally will sort of, it's a solid solution between the two. So uh, it can be quite difficult to pick which one's which. They can look very similar to one another. Uh, andradite, depending on where it comes from, can be brown or green or even black. And it occurs, occurs mostly in scarns and, and some igneous rocks as well. Um, a couple of key ones here, Mount Garnet, uh, a very similar color to this uh, South Australian one, uh, maybe a little bit more opaque generally than this, this one is, but, but very similar in terms of color. Um, and in Tasmania in particular, uh, we've got some which grade into uvarovite. In fact, uvarovite and uh, chromium andradite have both been recorded and they're both very bright green crystals. So you can't pick which ones very easily between the two. Uh, and we get um, cyanite dikes down at Signet in Tasmania that has some beautiful little black, um, black jet black opaque crystals as well. This one photographed here from Mary Kathleen is an unusual one and the garnets appear to have actually been partially melted or absorbed or, or something, resorbed maybe. Um, it is quite an unusual looking uh, garnet specimen. And another one from Mary Kathleen here where you've actually got three different colours of garnet. They're all andradites. So you've got the green, you've got an orange, and you've got more of a brown colored one here. Uh, and probably different uh, amounts of uh, iron or whatever at, at the uh, times of forming the, the various parts. And then on the right, it's my little andradite caterpillar from Dookie in Victoria that I found probably 35 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Angus the Knight, another type locality uh, mineral and only found at the one locality, which is Penrice Quarry. Uh, it was found in the phosphate zone sitting above the, the marble. And that whole area, I think, has been uh, quarried out now. So uh, there's no more. And uh, similar to the Aldermanite, you can see here, these are the, the crystals of Angustonite, these little ones sort of micaceous ones again, and they're actually seen on minulite crystals, which are the prismatic ones. And we move into 
anglosite. <coughs> this most of the anglosites are colorless or white, <coughs> excuse me, or maybe a gray sort of a color, and not necessarily all that attractive. But at Broken Hill, uh, there was uh, a couple of occurrences of these green anglosite crystals, and they're very much sought after. They can occur up to uh, a few uh, centimeters as well, most of them are uh, less than five mil, but, um, but very, very attractive. Broken Hill, of course, is, is the best known uh, area for anglosite uh, in Australia. And um, as you can see here, exceptional crystals of 10 centimetres in size have been recorded from Broken Hill. That was in the early days. Uh, colourless ones here, these are elongated ones. Some of these can be quite challenging to, to pick between this and sericite. And a couple of the more sort of traditional looking ones, the sort of a grayer color, not very attractive. And these ones, which look quite similar to, to barite, it's obviously the same crystal system as, as barite. <coughs> and another one from Broken Hill. And then this one here, which is very tiny little anglesite crystals. Uh, around a core of galena and there's a little bit of um, orange minium uh, that's occurred there as well. Anchorite is a carbonate mineral that is probably rare. Um, a hell of a lot of localities where anchorite has been recorded, <clears throat> but as um, a lot of those are being analysed, they found that they're actually ferroan dolomite, so the morons dolomite end of the series rather than the anchorite. Even this particular occurrence here, which has traditionally been a standout for anchorite crystals, uh, Ralph Bottrell has now said that these are probably likely to be ferroan dolomite rather than anchorite. So that actually may not be an anchorite specimen. Uh, Annabergite is uh, uncommon. Uh, there's a number of uh, nickel deposits, particularly in Western Australia and in Tasmania, a little bit in New South Wales, <coughs> where it has been recorded, but it's mostly recorded as either a green stain or a crust or whatever. Um, and this is the only crystalline specimen that I'm aware of, and it belongs to um, Chuck Aiden. Uh, who I think is an American. He actually bought the specimen because of its Cambaldaite, which is a rare type locality mineral uh, in Australia, and found the Annabergite, um, which is a bit of a surprise. And they're very nice crystals, I have to say. <coughs> Antigorite is one of the serpentine minerals. It can be quite difficult to uh, identify, to distinguish from other serpentine minerals as well. I've said here that this, this one's possibly antigorite. It's probably more likely, probably antigorite. And that's the green mineral. Um, these are blebs of stitchite. And you can see inside the stitchite are little chromite grains as well. Uh, and it's fairly quite typical of um, some of the material from stitchite hill, the type locality. And it's thought that the, the stitchite has actually formed as an alteration product of of chromite. Now, chromite is very difficult to alter in nature. So there's still the jury's still out a little bit on that one. The actual specimen itself uh, and the slide belong to Keith Lancaster. He passed away uh, probably about 15, 16 years ago, maybe a bit, long, bit longer. And was a well-known Tasmanian that, that wrote books on Australian and Tasmanian uh, mineral occurrences. And native antimony, uh, we've got a, quite a few stibnite deposits, uh, particularly in Victoria and in New South Wales. And a hell of a lot of the early um, references for antimony uh, were probably just stibnite um, because they were written more by mining people or geological people rather than mineralogists. 
uh, antimony in its native form does occur, but it's, it's fairly rare. And when you look at a specimen, you can't necessarily pick it from stibnite, although it is a little bit more tin white than stibnite. But when you see the two together, uh, you can certainly uh, tell them. <clears throat> Antlerite is a rare sulfate, probably not so rare in um, Chile, uh, where Jane took us to uh, in the last session. But in Australia, it's, it's fairly rare. Uh, this is the only one that I have got that I can guarantee is antlerite because uh, it is quite difficult to distinguish, particularly from brockantite and, and a couple of other um, copper sulfate species. But this particular one has been an analyzed, <coughs> excuse me, and it's um, sort of little platy crystals. It's quite, um, quite attractive. Uh, I've lumped all of the appetites into appetite, so in the A's. And that's for the main reason because uh, it's the term that is generally given to appetites that have not been specifically identified. And like some of the other minerals we've, we've discussed, it can be quite difficult to distinguish between a fluorapatite and a hydroxyapatite. Um, although in some cases habit can, can certainly assist, but there's not necessarily a, a guarantee. Um, Fluorapatite is generally the most common though. Hydroxylate apatite is less common and chloroapatite is actually rare. It occurs in many, many different types of rocks. Uh, the, the ones that are of most interest um, from a collector point of view are the uh, granites and the pegmatites and some of the basalts and in many instances uh, fluorapatite can also fluoresce. And it, sometimes you can pick up the fact that there is apatite in a specimen through fluorescence before you can actually see it. <clears throat> um, on the left here is it a good example of where you can't necessarily pick uh, which appetite it is. And this one used to be called carbonate fluorapatite, I think, uh, but it's now just carbonate rich fluorapatite <clears throat> from the Iron Monarch. And at Lake Boga in Victoria, you have zoned crystals, you know, nice blue zoning in these, of hexagonal uh, fluorapatites. And uh, Pyramid Hill, which is not far from Lake Boga, also has uh, apatite crystals as well. Now, this is probably fluorapatite, but it's not been analysed. Then in basalts, um, at the Anarchies in Victoria, it's mostly scoria. And so things get dragged up from deep down. And this is a, a xenocryst that has been dragged up, but it's actually an of appetite and it's actually hollow through the middle, which is um, quite interesting and fairly unique, I think. And you can see that it's quite rounded on the outside too. And that's because it's been brought up with the lava, it's, it's been cooked on the way up. Apophyllite is quite similar uh, to appetite in that it can be quite difficult to distinguish between species. So again, I've put them all in uh, under the one heading. <clears throat> this particular one is hydroxyapophyllite K with naturalite from Ard Glen in New South Wales. This one here is one of my favourites and it's um, probably fluoropophyllite K uh, sitting on inner site uh, blades and um, most of the apophyllite at Broken Hill, you'll see one in a minute, are more of the sharp pyramidal or relatively sharp pyramidal crystals, whereas these ones are much more blocky and it's a much rarer occurrence. Uh, this is, these ones are more typical of what you find at Broken Hill. Uh, the one up on the top left here, I've put in to show the cleavage planes. You can see cleavage planes through there and there, uh, which is very typical for the species 
And then this one on the bottom right hand side is looking down on the C axis. So there's your, your pinacoid on the top of the crystal. And that one's actually not a Braben Hill one. So that's um, from Avebury in Tasmania. But same sort of habit as the, uh, uh, actually it doesn't say Broken Hill on there, it should say Broken Hill. <laughs> Oops. Um, on the right hand side as well, these little crystals here are pre night crystals. And then a couple of Victorian ones, uh, fairly corroded crystal. So this has been leached. Uh, and there's a little bit of that happening on this one as well. And that's from the uh, Harkaway, uh, which is a suburb of Melbourne. And that particular quarry no longer exists and has been built over. So these ones won't come out anymore. Very nice little natural light needles here. And it's on a bit of um, Phillipsite as well, which is all of these ones you can see through here. <clears throat> uh, with calcite crystals too. All right, there's photo of the day, 27th of June from Mindat. Um, very thin bladed aragonite crystals uh, from um, New South Wales. Now aragonite is very common in uh, volcanic rocks in Victoria, uh, also in limestones, um, other environments as well. It's usually more prismatic, uh, equidistant sort of cross-section crystals uh, rather than the thin bladed ones, although these do occur. It's interesting to get um, Mindat photo of the day with a broken crystal in there as well. <laughs> so it's part of the story of the specimen, I suppose. In Tasmania, in particular, in, in one of the stitch type localities, uh, there were um, seams of what was originally determined to be magnesite, which is actually aragonite, and occasionally you'll get quite nice crystals such as these ones on the uh, serpentine. <clears throat> and the top left is, is one of a couple of uh, localities where you get more of a pinky or pale purple aragonite. And the thought is that that's due to strontium in the uh, in the mix that's causing the, the color. And these at this particular quarry here in in Tasmania, uh, that crystal is about as big as the individual ones get that are well formed, terminated. These ones here are more of a massive um, aragonite. It's still crystalline, but they don't have terminations. And on the right hand side is the more typical form of the, the ones in the volcanic rocks and shows the, uh, the typical sort of terminations that you find on, uh, on these crystals. An ugly one on the top left, it's got multiple terminations on here. So there's obviously been different episodes of, of um, fluids going through that have sort of built up the crystals. <clears throat> and the one on the right is particularly interesting because it's got this unusual zigzag uh, on the faces of some of the crystals here. And I have absolutely no idea how that has formed or why it has formed um, and why it's only on some of the crystals. It just, it's just really odd. If anybody's got any ideas on that, I'd, I'd be interested to hear. This is your traditional sort of aragonite that we get in the, um, the basalts. Very, very difficult to extract in one piece. Uh, because they uh, they do cleave very readily and you can see there's a little bit of a cleavage the cleave crystal just on the side there so it's very hard to get these out in one piece but when you do you'll get specimens like this and of course we do also have the sort of floss fairy form of um, aragonite as well uh, these are just a couple of examples from a, a, an obscure quarry in Victoria. Um, and they do fluoresce. This white fluorescence uh, is under long wave UV. Another very rare one, Arterite, is one of a number of minerals uh, in Australia that were first described from Australia that are a result of bat poo. So caves uh, where there has been a mixture of um, 
fluids coming through the rocks and dissolving the minerals in the rocks and that interacting with bat guano and forming a range of different phosphate minerals. This is a particularly rare one. It's found at three Western Australian localities, but you can see here that width of view there is 2.5 millimetres. So that's less than a millimetre in size. And that's all that I've got. <laughs> uh, Deolite is another uh, phosphate that is found in caves and again formed by uh, interaction with the bat poo. Um, and this particular one, the, it's not a specimen that you can mount. It's actually basically dust, <laughs> just breaks up. Another very rare mineral is arsen disclosite, uh, and it's only found at the one locality, which is at Patapa in South Australia, and as rare yellow crystals. They're very distinctive when you do find it but um, they can be tra quite translucent, such as these, or through to opaque. And arseniosiderite is another one of the rare uh, arsenates as well, found at, at uh, a few localities. <coughs> this particular one is a dome rock specimen in a John Haupt uh, photo. I don't actually have an arseniosiderite myself. And the arseniosiderite is these brown crystals, these round ones here. Uh, on Connie Calcite. Uh, <clears throat> iron arsenate, arsenopyrite is very, very, very common. Uh, it can be found in quite distinctive crystals and sometimes uh, in what's called trillings, twinned crystals. This one, which gives you a six rayed sort of a star. This particular one here is interesting and in we're missing one of the, the rays, just never formed. So I have no idea why that, that uh, formed in that particular way. It's quite interesting. <clears throat> Can be confused with lollingite at uh, Broken Hill. I know a lot of the specimens that look like arsenopyrite have been labeled as lollingite over the years. And now more and more people uh, are getting theirs analysed and they're finding that predominantly they're actually asking for it. I think there's a MINDAT um, topic on that subject uh, for that particular location. Uh, we do get very, very sharp crystals. This is at a, uh, a mine in New South Wales um, where there are quite nice crystals of tetrahedrite, boronite, boronite, <clears throat> and a lot of arsenopyrite. Uh, Mineral Hill in New South Wales, which is best known for its azurite and malachite, uh, but there is arsenopyrite crystals in the, the matrix. Um, most of this matrix is pyrite and it does tend to decompose a little bit. And here's another trilling. You can see the six sided um, or six rayed arsenopyrite here. And these little needles are actually a canthite. That was one that I collected many, many, many years ago. <clears throat> um, Arsenopyrite does sometimes occur in the country rock as well, particularly near contact zones. So uh, as an example, this is actually about a kilometer from where I live. And uh, it's uh, an altered sandstone and altered by the hydrothermal quartz veins that have run through that are, are gold bearing. Not exactly a euhedral crystal, but quite interesting. And then on the right hand side is another trilling. This one does have the six rays. <clears throat> the Kamida mine is a stibnite or antimony mine um, about half an hour away actually half an hour to drive and then probably another 45 minutes to walk from the car artonite is rare in australia uh, there's only the one locality in tasmania this is a ralph bottrell specimen and photo <coughs> and uh, very nice radiating crystals of uh, artonite ashburtonite another very rare mineral uh, the type localities Ashburton Downs in Western Australia. Uh, this particular one here that you can see is from near Broken Hill, the Broken Hill Consolidated Mine, <coughs> excuse me, and has been analysed. 
and is quite even though the color is very similar to the type locality material the habit is very different these are very small blocky crystals whereas the um, type locality are more acicular but as you can see that the color is very similar <clears throat> and onto the copper chlorides atacarmite um, some of the early specimens from Moon to Wallaroo and Kadena are, are arguably the best in the world. Those localities were, were mined from the mid 1800s onwards, and there are um, there were Atacarmite crystals that were like a foot or more in length. I'm not sure exactly what that would be in centimeters, but but large, very large crystals. Um, it's found in a lot of uh, sort of arid zone copper mines in Australia, of which the, there are quite a few in Queensland, New South Wales, and South Australia in particular. That's where you see most of the Atacarmites from. So this one's from North Parks in New South Wales. Broken Hill, New South Wales. The Great Australia Mine at Cloncurry in Queensland. <clears throat> Typical of um, uh, Atacarmite where the, the crystals uh, very dark green usually, but but quite often have a black look to the tips in particular. Uh, Moonta mine in South Australia. This is one of the smaller Moonta mine specimens. <laughs> and Kadena, uh, very, very nice grouping uh, with this one too. And again, you can see those black terminations. But of course, these days, Mount Gunson is probably the, the most well-known place for Atacarmite specimens. This one is looking down on the, the top of the crystals. Uh, you get this almost like parallel growth aggregate of crystals with the individual terminations. And this is what it looks like when you, you're looking at the side of one of these specimens. They're actually two different specimens, by the way, <coughs> just for the avoidance of any doubt. And also at Mount Gunson, we very rarely get nice little wolfenite, very sharp wolfenite crystals sitting on top of the uh, Atacama. As you can see, width of view there, three, three and a half mil. That's a tiny little orange wolfenite. It also looks like um, there's been an earlier growth of Atacamite, which has been coated by uh, iron manganese mineral of some sort, and then there's been a secondary growth. And a couple of others. This one here is a, an Atacarmite crystal with chalcosiderite. And this one, another analyzed specimen of Atacarmite from Western Australia. Getting towards the end, um, augite is another very common uh, pyroxene. It's usually black or, or dark green in, in colour. Uh, it can form a solid solution with other pyroxenes. So once again, can be quite difficult to, uh, to identify visually. Uh, it's found as a major con component of a number of meteorites and occurs in a lot of basalts and other um, igneous rocks. Here's another one with an andesine albite crystal. So you've got a, an augite crystal here, there's an andesine, a little bit of ilmenite there, and then a blob of hyalite opal on the, the tip of the uh, augite crystal too. Some of these are really interesting. The, the um, parogenesis is, is fascinating with some of them. And this particular one here has actually been identified as sodium augite. So it's still augite, but it's got, um, it's enriched in, in sodium. And this one was another MINDAT photo of the day um, crystal or specimen back in March. And it's highlight opal again on a, an augite crystal or two augite crystals. And it's just a blob on the top. <clears throat> and that's from the miner's rest quarry, which is Ballarat. So it's, uh, where are we? it's over in that direction, um, about 5k as the crow flies. Uh, Ori calcite, this is one of my older photos, and the reason I've left it in here is because it's one of the few specimens that I've got from the Australian Capital Territory. 
uh, that's a very small geographical area and doesn't have a lot of mineralogy. So I wanted to put something in there and I can't find the specimen. I need to retake it. That one's probably from about um, the late 2007, six, seven, something like that. It was probably a single shot photo through my microscope. We do have a, a, a few zinc mines uh, where uh, auric calcite occurs with rosacite and hemomorphite and white hydrozincite. <clears throat> and that's um, mainly uh, Broken Hill, obviously, um, and then in the Northern Territory and uh, at the Evelyn Mine and Billy Strings Mine and Arcarola are the main ones where you get these particular species from. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the top left hand one, I was particularly pleased with how that came out. The bladed crystals of aurocalcite. Um, it's very difficult mineral to photo and get enough contrast. You can see this one on the right. You can see that there are crystals there, but it's very difficult to actually get sharp crystals because of the, the lack of the camera's ability to distinguish between the colors predominantly. That's why I was so pleased with this one on the left. This is an interesting one from Chilago in, in Queensland, and there's quite a lot going on here. So you've got a little rosacite behind sitting there. This here is a ball of rosacite with aurocalcite tufts on top. And then here you've got more of a greenish aurocalcite. And then these ones, these sort of fibrous looking things um, that look like I haven't cleaned the specimen are also aurocalcite and all sitting on a bed of quartz. Another one that was difficult to actually get uh, any definition, although even when you look at the specimen under the microscope, it, it does look like that anyway. There's hardly any definition of, of crystals, but nice colours. And then this one here from Western Australia, uh, which is an unusual locality, but it has cobalt and or cobalt bearing calcite that, that gives it this pink colour too. And here we have a mineral that isn't so um, Orostibite I've got listed. It is probably relatively common in the stibnite deposits, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, but it's very difficult to pick up. And the reason being is that it looks like arsenopyrite, not as crystal form, but when you just get a bleb in the quartz, uh, it looks very much like non-crystalline arsenopyrite. <clears throat> and they both occur in each of the deposits. But when you get this form here of sort of spongy orangey red gold, which is what this is, that is where the orostibite used to be. And it's dissolved away and left this spongy gold in its place. And you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick it, except that here you've got pure native gold here and here and dotted around here. And when you get the two together, it's very easy to see where the orostibite used to be. So if you have specimens like this, you still look around for anything that looks like arsenopyrite, and it might actually be orostibite. Austenite, that's these yellow crystals. I only found at the one, <coughs> the one locality, but it's relatively common at that locality. What is not common is the heady vein in such well-formed crystals as, as this one. Um, Autonite is common, but a bit hard to find. Um, for the most part, it's tiny little crystals in, in granites uh, and can easily be confused with saleite and, and maybe meta natro autonite as well. Um, all three of them fluoresce quite strongly uh, with the same sort of colour and they all look very similar in colour to this, which is sort of a, a greenish yellow. So that's the that's the autonite there. And this is all esophorite. Another phosphate mineral. <clears throat> and that's that same specimen under UV. Over on the right here is, is probably it's more of a hand side specimen of autonite and probably a meta something uh, because of the, uh, the opaqueness of the crystals, but not analyzed. 
Now going on to axonite, um, there are three species of axonite that are, are recorded in Australia. That's the Fe, which is the more common one, the magnesium and the manganese. Uh, this particular one is a, an Fe one from Coldwell Kill in Tasmania. And it's with arsenopyrite. You can actually see the reflected, the, the arsenopyrite is quite uh, reflective faces. You can see the crystal reflected through there, which is quite nice. A very pale pink color from uh, Corop in Victoria. And then also in Victoria, the Gravel Hill Quarry in Ascot Hills is this tiny little group here of a cluster of crystals with dan Danburite which is uh, quite rare in Australia. It's these white crystals. <coughs> and uh, another dookie, a dookie specimen here with um, a, a group of crystals, quite an unusual, almost looks like a quinzite specimen, quite unusual um, uh, form with andradite garnet and um, Tremolite, actinolite, which is a, the fibrous bit. So that's probably actinolite there. And this is probably tremolite here. And then we get onto Bruce's blue mineral, azurite, the last one. So very, very common in copper deposits in Australia. There's a lot of copper in Australia, right from Queensland down through New South Wales into South Australia in particular. Um, lesser amounts in Tasmania, Victoria, and Western Australia, but there are still a few. Um, Mineral Hill is probably the best known one and the Triaco uh, open cut back in the late 1980s uh, produced the vast majority of the, uh, the really well-formed blue, azurite and green malachite that you see still from time to time on the market. And very reflective faces. This one here is reflecting this is all reflected malachite through here. That's another mineral here, one that's more of a transparent blue crystal. <coughs> uh, another one from, New, from uh, Mineral Hill in New South Wales. And what I've included down in the bottom left hand corner is a photo I took of this specimen 25 years, uh, no, 15 years ago, not 25 years, 15 years ago. It's a single shot photo using a Sony point and click camera uh, through the eyepiece of my microscope. Um, and that shows you where photography has, has come in the last 15 years, the difference between the two. Uh, Girolambone is another, uh, or was another uh, very rich oxide zone copper mine in New South Wales. Uh, these are from two different benches. This is from number 23 bench and a sort of a platey habit. <clears throat> and then when they got down to the number 27 bench, more of a prismatic habit. And you can't really see it too well, I don't think, on this photo here. But if you look at this particular image on Mindat, if you go to my homepage and bring up photos and search for Asia Right, you'll find it. Here, across there and across there, is a phantom. I have never ever seen a phantom azurite before, but there's enough translucency in this crystal to be able to see that phantom line it goes across there, a bit of displacement on that face. Um, and I was quite impressed when I saw that. I didn't actually see it until I finished taking the photograph. Uh, staying in New South Wales, we have Cobar, had some, it was a, fairly large number of mine, copper mines in the Cobar area. And this one also has malachite after azurite on this side. And from Woodlawn, which closed in the 90s, early 90s, I think, uh, um, and has since been rehabilitated too. Uh, but very nice, more micro crystals of, of azurite. <coughs> Excuse me. But Broken Hill produces, rarely produces some very, very nice uh, azurite specimens. These are a couple of mine. And of course we have Mel Bunker in the Northern Territory. Dean McLaughlin is up there as we speak with his last year of mining the Mel Bunker azurite suns. 
Um, so if he can get to Tucson next year, and it's probably still a big if at the moment, that might be the last time you'll see fresh material coming out of that mine. These are a couple of examples of floater uh, suns, sharper one on the, the right hand side. Unusual one from the Inkerman mine. It looks like it's got white edges, but it's actually just the, the way that the crystals have actually formed. a sort of like a ragged edge crystal and the reflected light gives it this sort of white look. And then we've got another one. This is an older photo I need to retake um, from the Mount Cobalt mine where quartz has come through after the age right and just coated it all. And from South Australia, we have Azurite and Olivenite, the green crystals, and Azurite and Labethanite from Burra. Burra is very well known for its copper minerals. The Burra mine started operation in about 1845, I think. <coughs> and you see classic pseudomorphs of malachite after azurite from the Sir Dominic mine in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. You don't always see so much in actual azurite where it hasn't altered. And yes, that colour is true to life. It's a very odd coloured specimen. And I think the last couple of photos here, we've got a Lake Burger one, so Victorian specimen. Uh, Azurite is very rare in Victoria. And in Western Australia, the Teutonic bore deposit uh, produced some very fine Azurites, very small, but very fine Azurites, uh, again, back in the, uh, the 1990s predominantly. So do we have any questions? I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do try. Dave. Dave. Yes. Right at the start, you said there were five states, but there were six spots. Is Tasmania not counted? Yeah, Tasmania is a state. So you've got Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. Oh, bugger. <laughs> 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 South Australia, West Australia. Yes. Sorry, there are six states. I'll change that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Tasmania normally gets left off maps, but not forgotten that way. I don't know why I did yeah. that. Don't forget the state of confusion. Yeah, I think I'm well and truly in that one. <laughs> uh, so no questions. Um, at least we were paying attention. Yeah, true. More so than me. <laughs> Oh, very, very well done. Very well covered. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Happy birthday, Neville. <laughs> <laughs> that Facebook hey guys. Hey, guys. Chuck and I are in, uh, in Germany in a hotel room, so we're, we're sitting just next to each other. We just looked at your presentation, and it was great. Uh, I love Australian minerals. So uh, the next 25 is B to unto, unto Z. So uh, we're looking forward to that. <laughs> I've got a long way to go yet. <laughs> pictures. I love your pictures. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's going to take some time to, to complete the... Um, the yeah, yeah, four years. Oh, four, four or five years. <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't have a problem. <laughs> Yeah, All right, if there's no questions then. No. Everybody, everybody's speechless. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> very good. I, I have to say, is, is uh, yeah, Jane's still there. Jane's on mute at the moment, but Jane did say to me at one stage, she doesn't really have any interest in Australian minerals. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping... Yeah. That, Seems uh -huh. like this might change her mind. Huh? <laughs> well, I'm, mine's changed. I really like Australia. Uh, my my avatar is a koala, by the way. Anyway, well, this so. is true. This is true. <laughs> no, I wondered. I, I like the way you said the meteorites had landed. Did they go through customs and COVID <laughs> tests? 
Uh, I think they were pre-COVID. <laughs> I need to spend any sort of time. But if there has, nobody's been able to go out and collect them anyway. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, um, we'll fold the meeting up. And in two weeks' time, it'll be... Oh, hang on. Quentin, are you waving goodbye? or oh, We say you're on mute, that's all. So, um, uh, Martin, in two weeks' time, with uh, part one of the Cumbrian minerals, which I'm particularly interested to see. I've got a, a soft spot for Cumbria. Um, one of my sisters still lives in Skimmerness, which is up on the coast there. And my parents lived there for quite a few years. Uh, so, um, yeah, I've managed to, to get there a couple of times myself. Um, not for a while, obviously. But, uh, yeah, very much looking forward to that. So, um, remember, if you haven't already, to register uh, ahead of time. The second session is already up there as well. So, you can register for that one. Uh, at the same time if you want to do that and um, we'll see you all in two weeks time